Um, so slightly different um, setup than some of our usual um, webinars, which you may have been joining. Um, so this one's going to be hosted by um, quite a lot of our colleagues from all around um, our academy sites. Um, so I'll be handing over to Richard to introduce you to everybody. Um, and it is slightly longer than um, most of our usual sessions. So we two hours today. So we understand that a few of you might be popping off to top up your coffee. I know I certainly will. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining. You will all receive um, certificates for today as well um, as part of your, of your CPD. Um, and I will take over the, the chat function as well. So you'll be able to, to chat any questions you have to me there as well. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get started just while the, the last few people are joining. Um, and I'll hand over to Richard, who's on the buttons today, and he will introduce you to the rest of the team that we have here. Great, thank you, Katie. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, uh, the, the Wednesday webinar. Like Katie says, um, we've got a big group today. Um, so we've changed from our Zoom meeting format to an actual Zoom webinar. That means a little bit less interaction on your side, but, um, but you still have the chat function. So as we go through this presentation today, uh, Katie's just put a message up there so you can ask questions or um, make complaints, do whatever you want. But that's how we're going to communicate today. We've still got people joining, so we're, we're almost 100 in today. So that's very good, very exciting. So this isn't one of our usual topics. So we've been doing lots of these webinars over the past few weeks and we'll continue to do so. And I think we certainly will continue to do so even beyond this period, um, bringing you either amputee rehab product related information from ourselves or also getting key opinion leaders, people with uh, research presentations. We've got some good programs coming up in the next few weeks. But again, look out on the website for those and um, we'll have certainly something to entertain you with, I hope. So we've got a few people in, and before I do the introductions, um, those of you who I'm sure you've all used Zoom before, everyone's using it for um, private and personal use and also work-related things. But if you haven't, you've got some screen options. You can choose the views you look at, um, but if you want to keep the screen in full view, then you get the biggest um, appreciation of, of what we're showing. And today we say we are talking about early amputee rehabilitation and um, looking at some alternative clinical pathways that we, we have uh, there. So what I'm going to do before we start, I'm going to go to a poll. So I want to actually uh, find out who we've got in the room today, and this helps us. So I'm going to launch the poll. So you'll see you have a, a question comes up. Who do you think you are? Um, pressed away. We usually do this a bit of, a, a bit of comedy to this. Um, because usually first thing on a Monday or last thing on a Friday, people can't distinguish the week from the weekend. Um, some people struggling with their role at the moment, whether they're homeschoolers or wannabe hairdressers or home bakers, we put all of those in. I can see we've got 60, 70 responses already. But this just gives us a feel and a flavor for who we've got in today. Just gonna give you a few more seconds on that and see what's what. I see a very, um, strong theme appearing of, of what's what. And I'm just going to close the poll now and let's see where we are. We'll keep it close that. Good. Let's see who we have. So you are today mostly physiotherapists. So my colleague Greg will be very pleased about that. We've got a few problems. There's some students. Great that we've got students on board. Um, again, you'll be, we've had a few of you join already. Just take it, join, join again. It's all it's all good information. It's not terribly serious, although it's serious content, but we try to take um, you know, a conversational, light-hearted approach on this. And again, don't be shy of asking questions. Um, we're an academic, that's good, and a few others. Um, I wonder, I wonder, maybe they should have been a bit more explicit with the list. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through our colleagues that I'm going to introduce. Um, and first of all, I'm going to start off with my good colleague, Felix, who is in Bayreuth in Germany. So Felix, I know that you're muted and I don't think I can unmute you, but Felix is one of our um, clinical specialists. He's a prosthetist from Germany. He's worked with our company for some time and he's going to be um, doing some demonstrations today. He's got a user coming in, <laughs> yeah, ready, and we'll be practicing good social distancing and, uh, and hygiene skills. Um, also, I'm going to introduce, <laughs> very good, also introduce my colleague Peter, who's a physiotherapist from Eindhoven, um, or works out of our Eindhoven office. Good morning, Peter. 
how, how are you? Also on mute, that's <laughs> very good. Um, and finally, I'm going to introduce you to our colleague, Magnus Lulia. Uh, not finally, actually, um, sorry, next will be Magnus, who will start the um, meeting in a moment. So Magnus is a colleague, he's responsible for um, our academy, our educational part of our organization in the Nordic countries. So we, we has a team of almost 600 clinicians working with him. And so he's very keen on looking at best practice guidelines and who chooses um, what uh, uh, clinical pathways to follow and what products and protocols to use and things like that. And so welcome Magnus, we'll start with you in a moment. And also finally, um, to my colleague Rachel, who is our physiotherapist working from home today in Bramall, but Rachel will be joining us um, a little bit later on in the presentation. Yep. Morning everyone. So good, good morning Rachel. Um, I'm going to just start our presentation now and go over to uh, uh, the slides, look at that. And before I start and let Magnus take the, um, take the microphone, just give you control Magnus on the mouse, so you're good to go and if you're unmuted. Um, Early amputee rehabilitation, we've called this. And um, since I, I, I used to be a prosthetist working in the NHS from way back in the 1980s, and even back then, there was a huge variability in um, where our amputees came from. So our new amputees, or primary amputees, as we would call them, and also the type of amputation residual limbs that they came with. And I know back then, one of our rehab uh, consultants in rehabilitation medicine um, Ernest Van Ross was very keen to audit the type of amputations that were being done and would try to reflect that back to the referring surgery uh, teams um, with a view to trying to get some consistency. It was a very um, sort of a contentious issue almost. Even today with, within the NHS England, there's a service review in the prosthetic service. And on a prosthetic side, it, there's very keen and strong guidelines about um, encouraging us to use consistent methods in socket prescription and how we do best practice in providing sockets and socket fitting methods but really the profession is saying it would help if we started from a consistent um, starting point um, in terms of trying to reduce this variability of, of amputation surgery that's being done and i think as i've worked in ossa in the past so many years i've been lucky to travel the world and see different rehabilitation pathways that have followed the patient through from pre-amputation um, right the way as an integral process into early prosthetic rehabilitation um, and maybe in the UK that's not always been the case and certainly our, our patients, our, our, our pre-amputees become amputees and then into the prosthetic users, they go through a different variety of service um, regimes and sometimes you can view it as the the end of the vascular surgeon's journey in terms of uh, looking at limb salvage. Um, but in other countries, it's very much seen as the beginning of the orthopedic surgeon's journey, uh, taking that patient into a, into a new regime. And so we raised the question of, of who does the amputations, what process does that patient then follow all the way through? So that's what we're talking about and some of the tools that we have I'm going to hand over to you, Magnus, just make sure we can hear you and you've got control of the slides. Um, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Well, I will be talking about a holistic view of the whole treatment pathway of a new low limb amputee. And what I would like to do is just to introduce you to the rehab process that was presented uh, long time ago but i think it's still quite valid uh, it's positioned as as points preoperative amputation post-op treatment prosthetic provision rehabilitation and i think this view is quite good to understand what is happening however we know know that this is not Sep completely separate parts it's uh, it's coming over each other we know that rehabilitation doesn't start in the end it's all over the place and that is good and I'm, but i think this is a good way to see the whole picture of what we're doing and i'm going to go through it a little bit and we know that one of the most important parts in the rehabilitation uh, no matter of the age it is the mobility of the amputee to get up and become mobile and 
if we look into the physical activity, activity that um, the amputees do is actually uh, the most popular activity is television. And second activity is social activities. And it's all related to the use of the lower limb prosthesis. This means that we have something that we have to look into and that is completely rehabilitated and mobile patient. So that must be the aim. And of course, it is on the uh, individual level. Some patients want or amputees wants to be able to run. Other are just happy if they can stand up. And other would like to go to the library to, to be able to read the daily news. So it's on individual level, but we want to have them completely rehabilitation, rehabilitated. Well, these two pictures illustrates two different hospitals in the south of Sweden. The gentleman on that hospital where he was amputated, we can see in the, in the statistics that 11% of the amputees become prosthetic users. That's one out of 10 that becomes a uh, prosthetic user. The lady here is uh, representing a different hospital, but with the same uh, sort of, uh, of people of, of uh, uh, people living in that area, so to say. And on that hospital, 55% of the amputees become prosthetic users. So every second amputee become a user on her hospital and in the other hospital, one out of 10. It's quite a big difference in my, from my point of view. And, and the question is why does it differ so much between the two hospitals. When we looked into it, we could see that on the latest hospital with 55% uh, becoming a prosthetic users, they worked in multidisciplinary team. And, but if you ask every hospital, they would say that they are working in multidisciplinary team, but it has to be a really working together. It has to be a team. And the second part that we could see is that they had implemented and work, work according to clinical guidelines. They had used clinical guidelines for the whole process. And that mean, meant that everybody knew what their colleagues were doing, what was happening throughout the whole process. And if it works, perfect. 55% uh, can get a prosthesis. The median time from amputation will be about 41 days until they get fitted with the prosthesis. And from the physio's point of view, 64% of those that were fitted with the prosthesis had a good function with the prosthesis. And the median time for survival was 3.5 years. And that's quite long for this patient group. Well, we start to look into the first part, preoperative consideration, what is happening. In the, and there are a lot of things that we have to consider, but I will focus on nutrition and functional status. And we know it's a lot of things, but I picked out two of them, looked at them because it's quite interesting. We have a study from quite a quite old study from the 90s, and we can see that in this study they had two groups with 32 patients in each group, and they followed them five days preoperative and treat uh, the and then postoperative six days. Uh, the test group were uh, given the traditional hospital food, and they also had uh, extra nutrition. In the, in the other group, they had only the food, uh, the hospital food for that group. And they could see in the nutrition group, we could have 21 that healed, and in the control group, only 10 healed. We can also see it's remarkable though, about the amputation and also about the deceased. It had a quite big difference between the two groups. And the uh, conclusion was that almost 90% of the tibial amputees that entered the hospital were malnourished. And pre and postoperative supplementary nutrition improved the wound healing without increasing the, the stay in hospital. So if we put some effort into this, we can really make a difference for our amputees.
but I think today it has been more and more recognized in the different hospitals and also in the, the process for amputees that this is a problem or has been a problem. Looking into functional status, while the, if we have a, a, a scheduled amputation, not a trauma or emergency amputation, but if we have a scheduled one, we know that while the patients are waiting, they will be sitting down and the contracture starts at the 72 hours. We also know that we have to maintain the ability to walk if they are able to walk. And we have to maintain the muscle function for the patient to be able to really start and go into a good rehabilitation after the amputation. And because of this, we actually need to have physiotherapy pre-operative. This is so important, I think. We could make a big difference if we could, uh, could implement this. And um, I really would like this to be one of a new part. Uh, I know at many hospitals, this is not considered as a problem because they think they don't need it, but I still think that we we could really make a difference if we started physiotherapy preoperatively. On functional status, one of the, what we call it, million dollar question is, will this patient be able to use a prosthesis and walk after the amputation? Well, I think it's a good, good way of, of finding out is to, to look at what was the status three months before the amputation? Were the patient able to walk or wasn't the patient able to walk. If the patients were able to walk, the goal should be be walking after amputation. I think this, this is a very good way of looking into it. And we can see from studies we have done that this works very well. And, and it's an easy way to find out, it's just to check the three months, the state of three months before the amputation. And Magnus, before we carry on, do you have um, a poll question about uh, pre-amputation physiotherapy? Yeah. yeah, if we have, do we have a, a question on that, on, on how many is using pre physiotherapy pre-amputation? Yeah, so you've got a question coming up here. Um, are you and or your service involved in pre-amputation physiotherapy? Let's just see what kind of a split we get. So we've got answers coming in now. Um, up to 50 already, just keep those coming in. Just give that five more seconds, we're up to about 80 or so. Well done. I can see the answers coming in. Let's just have a look at this and share those results, Magnus. Yep. Well, let's see what we've got. Okay. I think that's a reflection of maybe the audience that we have and also maybe how our service is perhaps a little bit fragmented in, in the UK in terms of uh, the people who are in the call and also those who are involved separately in pre-amputation physiotherapy, perhaps on different sites. Yeah, but I think I still think it's good, good that we have at least 37 percent and uh, I'm, I'm not sure that is the, the, the numbers that we have in Scandinavia. I think it's less in Scandinavia, I think. So I think really 37 is a good, good start. Okay, well, we'll carry on with that. We've got a few more polls coming up just as we go along. Um, yeah, we look into the amputation then, and um, we we'll wait for the... I'm just, just going to clear that. There, it is. there you go, yeah. Here it is. And direct post-operative treatment, and that is the first week after the amputation. But... Uh, Here it comes. The fundamental uh, fundama fun foundation is the well-performed amputation. And we all, all know that this is very important. And um, as we can see, if you don't have it, the shark will come after you. And But the question is how to do it. How, what kind of amputation is to be performed? We want the, the limbs to be very good and nice. And there are several different techniques to be used. It's a long posterior flap, according to Burgess or Bruckner. You can also use the skew flaps or in the anterior uh, posterior fish mouth flap. You can also use the sagittal flap. 
or the Erdl's procedure. Well, here we can see one very nice um, amputation with the long posterior flap, and here we have a sagittal incision, also very good uh, to use. Uh, but the difference between these two is when we come to fit in the socket. Here is the sagittal stump coming into the socket, and here we have the long posterior fl uh, flap coming into the socket. And we know when you do the long posterior flap, you get this uh, bulbous shape of the stump, or what we call sometimes the dog ears. So the postoperative part of the uh, of this technique is that we have to focus on reducing these dog ears. So the physios have to really work hard to get rid of them so we can start the prosthetic fitting. Uh, however, if you use a sagittal incision, that is not the case. It's easier, it's much more correct the shape of the stump from the beginning. Here's two with long posterior flap. The difference between these two is that this one on the left is uh, with the uh, skin clips or staples, and on the right one, it's sutures. What is the difference between these two? Well, we can see here that this is quite common when you use staples. And looking into the literature, it says actually that you should not use uh, skin clips when you're performing amputation, and there is a increased risk for infection and, and also an increased uh, risk for revision if you use the skin clips. So if you, please make sure that they don't use these uh, uh, staples uh, and as well when we come into compression therapy and if you have staples uh, it's not a good combination as we all can understand what will happen inside. Uh, another example of improvements that we can try to influence uh, among the surgeons is that we know the fibula should be sectioned one to one and a half centimeter proximal to the distal tibial end. And how to do that? How do, do we cut fibula? Well, nippers, that is, I think, quite common, and we shouldn't use that. It's an easy tool to use but it's not a good one. It's better to use a giggly saw or an oscillating saw. And the question is why? Well, with a nipper, you might create a spiral fracture of fibula up all the way up to the fibula head. And why does that uh, happen? Well, the, patient, uh, the patients that we have in becoming amputees, they are over 80s, most of them mean age and they have osteoporosis and we know that the, the quality of the skeleton is not that good so we, if you use a nipper you will quite easily create a spiral fracture and that is then giving us some complications when we do the prosthetic fitting and uh, with pain and also therefore it might prolong the rehabilitation time so if we just leave the nipper out we can have a much faster procedure with the whole prosthetic fitting and the rehabilitation time well the first week after the amputation what will happen what do we have to do well we should look into the, having control of the edema we have to have control of the wound healing <coughs> excuse me and we have to prevent contractures and avoid infections. How to control the edema and why? Well, there's looking into the science, we can see that if you use a rigid dressing to control the edema, you get the best results. You will, will reduce the pain, you will improve the control of the edema, and you have a faster healing, and you can finally have an earlier definitive prosthetic fitting if you use this method. And so that is very good. And if you look into the wound healing uh, postoperatively, we have to have control over several parameters. We have to have proper circulation for the patient to get the wound to heal. And 
that we will uh, achieve through early mobilization. And we will reduce pain. And that we will do by controlling the oedema. If we can control the oedema, we will immediately reduce the pain for the patient. We need optimal bandage over the wound, and what is recommended is occlusive wound treatment. And then, of course, there are other uh, parts that uh, is very important. The nutrition, as I mentioned earlier, the smoking, if they are smoking, the general condition, etc. So there are a lot of parameters that we have to have in control. But with a rigid dressing, we can have a, a control over the circulation pain and also having it uh, uh, together with an occlusive wound treatment. We have to prevent contractures during this first period. All prosthetists know that this is not uh, what we would like to see as the patient coming with a 90 degrees contracture over the knee and we have some kind of challenges to fit this patient with a prosthesis. So contracted prophylax is achieved if we use a rigid dressing postoperatively. If we look into the science, we can see that if they have soft dressing, 10 out of 52 develop the knee flexion contracture. But if they had a rigid dressing, none of the 57 in that group developed the contracture. So that is very important to, uh, to play with. Rigid dressing. Well, the risk for falls. We can see from a quite recent study that uh, more or less, uh, or a lot of our patients will fall. 20, more than 20% will fall during the hospital stay. 58% of all will fall during, when they come out in the community. And injuries during those falls is between 40 and 60%. So falling among lower limb amputees are quite frequent and we have to take care of these. And especially uh, those at hospital is, is quite, uh, quite important to reduce that number of 20%, one out of five. If we look into the stump damage, we have soft dressing, we had six falls, uh, and three out of them had a stump damage when they fall. The, the most alarming thing about this is that among these three that had a stump damage, two needed re-amputation to transfemoral uh, level. And in the group with a rigid dressing, four of those patients fall during uh, uh, the hospital stay, and none of them had a damage to the uh, to the stump. Looking into uh, a review from Reichmann and co-worker, we can see that based on the best available current published evidence, removable rigid dressings should be considered the first treatment choice for the postoperative care of transtibial amputees to optimize the outcome with regard to reduction in injury due to faults, knee flexion contractures, edema, healing time, time for, to prosthetic fitting and pain. So these were the, uh, the published evidence or the, the conclusion of the published evidence that uh, they found out when they did the review. That was the amputation and the first week. If we continue into the, the second and third week after amputation, we can move over to uh, some different aspects that we have in control over the wound healing and also the infection. Now we have to continue to control the oedema and we have to stabilize the volume of the stump. Looking into that, we can see if you're using soft dressing, well, this is an, a quite old study that I made in the 90s, and looking into that, we can see uh, the volume of the transtibial stumps. I normalized this to 100% at day five postoperatively, and then followed the development of the volume over time. And we can see that uh, at about 90 days, we had a stable volume of the of the stumps. So, and the idea was then that 
okay, when the volume has stabilized, then we can start the prosthetic fitting. That means it took about three months after amputation until we could fit the patient with a prosthesis without having to do a new uh, prosthesis after one or two weeks. However, this is not acceptable. We have to move this line to about one month. We have to have the volume stabilized after about one month so we can start the prosthetic fitting as soon as possible after the amputation. How to do it? How to, to uh, influence the, the volume of the stump or the, or the development of the volume? Well, we can use stump shrinkers, we can use soft dressing, or we can use a post-op liner. This is, this is a, a picture from the textbook of Engström and van der Veen, of physiotherapy for amputees. And this is not, not the way it should be. This is just a, uh, an example of how it shouldn't be. Uh, and it's also showing the difficulties of having a good soft dressing on the amputees. So therefore, it's better to go over and use the liner technique. It's so much easier, so much simpler, and so much more effective. I think uh, Peter will have some more about it later today. And shaping of the stump is also a part. And looking into studies, uh, we can see that the ISROS post-op liner is used for edema and volume control. And it's desired to avoid the bulbous shaped stumps uh, that might prolong uh, or the prosthetic fitting. And with uh, a compression therapy with a liner, it is much easier uh, to, to, to reduce or shape the volume but I think it's also good to remember the amputation technique that we try to avoid a long posterior uh, flap, according to Burgess, and try to move over to sagittal incision instead. <coughs> if we're using compression therapy, this is just an, a, a case. Uh, in late April, this patient was fitted with uh, compression therapy, newly amput just amputated and we can see what happened during the month. It took less than one month to have the stump shape very good, very well, and uh, possible to start the prosthetic fitting. Prosthetic provision then, going over to looking into a few slides on that. For whom? Is this our community, amputee community? No, this is a commercial picture. I think this is more reflecting the age of our amputees or these are actually quite young as well as our patients that we're working with but we have this elderly amputee and it's difficult to predict the mobility as talked of earlier and elderly amputees with mobility should always get gait training uh, i think for us who is working with it every day it's quite obvious but in the hospitals and among uh, other professions, it doesn't, they don't see it as, as that important as we do in, in that is working in it, within it. And remember this picture, the ability to walk, if the status three months before the amputation was that the patient were able to walk, even with support, the goal should be walking with, after the amputation. So we have to aim for that. But we, we have to remember this patient. This is our patient. They do, have a lot, but they don't have the limb. And there's another thing they don't have. They don't have time. How can I say that? Well, we know, uh, according to figures, that about 50% of the amputees will die, or the amputate, newly recently amputated, new amputated, will die within between six and 12 months. So that is the time we have. And when you don't have the time, you have to get up and, and being mobilized as soon as possible. We can't lay in bed or, or uh, just waiting for the prosthesis to, to produce the prosthesis. We have to do it as quick as possible. And one way of doing it is to using the direct socket. We do produce it directly on the patient and we can deliver it after two to four hours. 
and we can start the mobilization and gait training the same day. So I think this is very important. And comparing the diet socket versus traditionally, we have a, a study from 2011, and we can see the days to delivery is, is uh, different between zero and 17. And then we have the number of visits for the patients is reduced. We have the production time is reduced. The only thing that is increasing is the direct cost to 1.4. Uh, and that is the material costs for the prosthesis. But we're reducing all the other costs. So in total, it's a more effective and more and less costable custom uh, method to use. Rehabilitation then, looking into that. Well, we have some clinical cha challenges because we know the patient is missing muscle tissue, lever arms, contraction speed, proprioception, balance, a lot of other things, but they have, they do have instability and pain. And this is what we have to consider when we're going into rehabilitation. And I really think that we have to have uh, physios that are educated in gait training. And there are a lot of knowledge today uh, on how to do gait training for amputees. And I think if you haven't gone uh, through some of that, uh, that kind of uh, education, please make sure that you find a way to get some, some knowledge about gait training. But anyway, no matter how good we are in the whole process, or how perfect the process is, we will have problems with wound healing. We will end up with some issues. And what to do then? Well, I have a case that I just want to start with. This is a lady who was amputated, transtibial amputated on her left side. Her age is about 75 to 80 years old. She's living home in her house, and she's, well, living quite well. Uh, and then suddenly her right uh, foot became worse and bad and needed an amputation. She was transtibial amputated on the right side as well, but the wound didn't heal. So she was bilateral transtibial amputees with a wound that didn't heal on her right leg. And they waited and waited and it didn't heal. So what to do? Two things. Reamputate to a higher level. So she will become transtibial transfemoral bilateral. Will she be able to live in her house after that? No, she will not. And she realized that herself. So she uh, refused to have a reamputation. The other way is then, okay, we clean the wound and sit and wait until it has healed and make sure we can do anything to heal it. Well, how long time will that take? Not between nine and 12 months was the approximation time that they calculated on. And she would have to sit in a wheelchair during that period. She couldn't have a wheelchair at home, so we, she had to live in a, in a nursing home during that period, after nine months in a wheelchair, would she be, be able to become a bilateral transtibial amputee walker? Probably not. She would have to stay at the nursing home for the rest of her life. And that wasn't an alternative for her, so she refused that as well. So what to do? After discussion, they decided to fit her with a prosthesis, even though the wound looked like on the picture. Uh, and she came back for control three times a week, the first weeks. And after four weeks, it looked like this. After eight weeks, it looked like that. And after 12 weeks, it looked like that. And she'd been living at home during the period, as good as she could, walking with the prosthesis or two prostheses. I think quite a lot of you are, are familiar with Van Ross, and he heard about this as well, or had the discussions with the group in Sweden that performed this, 
case study and they discussed it and he ended up with a patient coming that uh, refused to have a re-amputation and he wanted to have his prosthesis. Uh, he didn't know what to do on Ross and so he, after long discussions, he fitted the patient with the prosthesis and he had the same development as you, I presented you in the previous slide, the wound healed. And this was a wound that, or a, a stump that he would like to re-amputate. But with the prosthesis, uh, it healed. So he became curious what's happening and he made a study on it. And he included 62 patients into the study that he actually would re-amputate in normal case, but now he fitted them with the prosthesis instead. What happened with the group, 62? Well, six withdrawn from the study, five deceased, five didn't heal, and 46% or 46 uh, patients, 74% healed as intended during this period. Uh, what to notice as well is that on the patients that didn't heal, the five, all of them were current smokers and continue to smoke. So that was it. And he has a quite good uh, paper where he presents the cases or some cases from the study. And I really can recommend you, if you're interested in this, to, to find this paper and read it. And he has a good, good discussions in the end about why this happens. Why did 46 patients heal that he planned a re amputation for? And his conclusion was early mobilization. This is the key to get the patient up and walk. If we can do that, we will have a quite a lot of, of, of benefits from the study, from, from, from the, the rehab process. However, I have far come to the end of this but uh, can we Richard can we do a poll as well now because I would like to know about amputation techniques I talked quite a lot on that how yeah. is it yeah let me just bring the poll up so um, I also have some questions for you as well regarding that so on the subject of amputation technique um, there's a slight change in language here but um, so here's a question for you. What amputation technique are you mostly presented with uh, in your clinic or in your, in your service? And I suppose, um, Magnus, one of the issues is, is um, why is there variability in, in the services that we, that we all work in? Uh, are, you, are you suggesting that maybe in, in your regime, in the, the Scandinavian countries, there is a more uh, a stronger consensus of opinion or do you do you also see variability as well yeah we do we do see and we have been quite uh, around quite a lot and uh, trying to educate surgeons to 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 move from long posterior flap to equal flaps or the sagittal view as we call it uh, and we see uh, during the 10 last years we can actually see a change in, in scandinavia and I think we had similar figures as you have now for about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And how do you think is there, how, how does that message get across to the, the surgical community? In terms, is, it, um, is it an evidence-based discussion? Is it a, a discussion of who performs the amputation or what, what, um, what the regime that the patient is in when they find themselves at the amputation stage? I talked at the beginning about how maybe, um, and, and I use the cliche because I, I've heard it in other places that it's the, the end of the vascular surgeon's journey in terms of limb salvage. But yeah. I know that in other countries, it's, it's maybe the orthopedic surgeon takes on the amputation because it's the, yeah. it's the beginning of a new episode for them. Yeah, it is. And I think what we can do is really, uh, if you look into the literature as it is today, or and has been, uh, there is no difference in the main part that the surgeon is interested in. It's no difference between long posterior flap and sagittal incision 
on looking at wound healing is the same. Number of infection is the same. And the, the more mortality is the same. And those three parts is the most important for the surgeon because the surgeon performs the, the amputation and then a few days and then it moves further on and the surgeon doesn't see. But if we take the discussion with them, we have to take the discussion and show them what will happen if you perform a poor amputation that doesn't work good. It will be a poor amputation for the rest of that patient's life. And it will influence the whole rehab process and the prosthetic fitting and everything as well. But if the, the surgeon perform a very well performed amputation, it will be that for the rest of that patient's life. And it will also make it much more efficient and improve everything in the prosthetic fitting and the rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we have to be able to take the discussions with them because they don't understand, they have no interest in what's happening later on in the process. They just see their part. Sure. And we, yeah. I've got, um, I've got a couple of uh, statements and some questions here. Um, the first one is, is that uh, um, it's a statement really, plastic surgeons often dictate that we cannot start mobilization or compression until after six weeks due to natural healing times of the soft tissue. Do you think six week deadline is reasonable or should we be pushing for um, a closer or a shorter time period, maybe four weeks? I think we should push it to a shorter time. Yeah. I think that it, it, if we can see the, that everything is good, or every, the healing is good and everything is happening, and we, then we can push it to at least four weeks post amputation we yeah. can start the fitting that i was certainly I, um, I was certainly around in the in the van ross era um, and was part of that team who were involved with um casting of quite challenging residual limbs really so transitive residual limbs um and uh, and it was it was seen as um, quite aggressive um, sort of prosthetic treatment uh, in terms of, of compressing the time frame down and certainly there were a lot of um, issues with respect to socket making. Um, but equally, our neighbours in neighbouring clinical facilities absolutely would not entertain that at all. So there was this, again, this huge variability of, of opinion and also yeah. what we call here is sort of postcode lottery in terms of where the patient lives. Of course, they're exposed to different, different um, rehabilitation regimes, but it's a very interesting period and it was reasonably controversial. Um, yeah. but also, what we found um, back then is that you, you're describing this total pathway that goes pre-amputation all the way through to early prosthetic. And we found sometimes that various areas of the country were maybe subscribing to components of that. Some of them might have been taking the compression therapy component, or some of them might have been getting involved with the amputation surgery technique, but few were integrating the whole process all the way through. Um, and, and the message that we were trying to convey is that if you're going to subscribe to this, everything is, is worth taking on. But then, of course, some of the health service structures, they can't do that because of the compartmentalization of the way the service is structured. Yeah, but I think it's, it's good, a good start is actually looking into the clinical guidelines and trying to, if you, if you don't have any clinical guidelines, just try to start to develop them uh, and then take the whole process yeah. from the start of then and having the, the guidance because then you can start to have the discussions in the different areas uh, hospitals and nurses homes as everything in your area if you can can yeah. have have them as a starting yeah. point so i've got a few a few more interesting questions one is um uh, so so to you magnus or some of the, the regimes you work with are or were the surgeons receptive to your input yes okay that's good yeah i um, I, I quite challenge them quite a lot and and uh, of course I have quite a lot of knowledge in the area as well I've been joining the surgeons in the performing the, the amputation I studied it quite a lot and therefore I could take the discussions but I also have to have the argument from the prosthetic fitting and the rehabilitation gait training with me to take the discussion yeah um, another question is uh, where is the line between effective early mobilization for wound healing and making the wound worse that is a very good question uh, there is no 
very very well defined line uh, it it becomes as it is today there is no studies on it there's no science it is just based on experience so and this I, experience that we, that we have to go through and, and i think the, going back to the photographs and um, that you showed from the the, the van ross papers and, and submissions was that um i think uh, observation and review was very much part of that so um, the patients were under a lot of scrutiny with respect to their wound care and we were taking photographs over the grid so you're able to objectively measure the, the effectiveness of the progress of wound healing. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was a, a case of constant review back then. I've got a few more questions coming in. Um, yeah, so we, we do have um, Mr. Neil Hopper on the, on, the, on the webinar, who is a vascular surgeon and also an amputee. And we, we've heard your story. Uh, Neil says he strongly believes that prosthesis should be involved in the preoperative stage, not only in terms of type of amputation, but also to give the surgeon awareness of, um, of amputation or amputation length for that patient. Uh, Magnus, do you think that happens elsewhere in, in the, the, where, where you've worked in the Scandinavian countries and elsewhere around the world? Is there a, a, a team input in terms of amputation. I would say in, in about 30 to 40 percent of the, the hospitals there is these teams where the, the, the prostate is involved also in pre-amputation but it's not that common. I, I assume that the physios is more involved in the pre-amputation treatment yeah. and but the prosthetists if they are involved they just come and show the prosthesis and, and present what will happen yeah. or the the physio will present the prosthesis this is what you will receive and this is what will happen in the gate training and prosthetic fit yeah uh, one more question what's the theory but behind early mobilization and the improvement in wound healing in um, in the studies that we've talked about if i if i mean it's, it's not my area of expertise at all but i remember there was a lot of discussion about um so within the the exit date and promotion promotion of growth hormone and, and um, areas like that. I remember that discussion, but but that is all in that paper, and I, and I think we'll we'll publish the references after this, and you can get that. It's a very, very good paper, and I really recommend. If you're interested in this and want to know more, read this paper because it's 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 very very good. Challenging it was it was at the time, and equally met with robust challenge from from other healthcare regimes, even neighbouring. Um, areas within the UK who absolutely did did not uh, participate in, in that kind of study. But, but this is what this top topic is about and it, it rolls on as always. Um, it was about variability and about, I think the key point of that presentation Magnus was about time that um, for, for many of these people who present later in their life with other healthcare com complications, time is not on their side. And if you want to make an effect, you need to act quickly and also giving the best chance for mobilization is, of course, with preservation of the knee joint. Yeah. And this, this was all part of that regime. Good. Good. Um, some good questions there. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll, we'll keep the questions coming in. I'm just going to close down the chat on that topic. And I'm now going to go to uh, my colleague Peter in Pinto. And I'm going to bring the presentation up again, Peter. And if you would like to... I'm going to give you control of your mouse, Peter. Um, if you're yeah. interested and want to crack on. Okay, let me check if, uh, if my mouse is doing what it should do. Just give it a wiggle. Not yet. Just wiggle it more. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I needed a good shake. Okay. Thank you all. We still have uh, 100 participants, so we're still uh, we're still good after one hour. Um, as uh, stated on the uh, on the slide, um, I'm going to discuss with you as a follow up on what Magnus' story is about. More going into detail in our into our products. So my 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 job is uh, that I work closely together with medical office, and we we need to check on on clinical evidence on the use of our products. So do they still um, uh, provide those functionalities and those and can we still claim what they uh, what we did earlier um, and, and and do do we can we say that outside so we're going to discuss a bit on the usage of the uh, rigid dressing and a bit on the post-op liners 
it's going to be a, a, a challenging part because I will switch over uh, to uh, to Richard and to uh, Felix during the presentation and even to Rachel. So uh, challenging, but also uh, I think it's called interactivity and there will be also some pollings uh, in between. So um, uh, discussing post amputation management um, of a residual limb um, is, is, is often an, uh, a place where we want to achieve a long-term patient outcome. Uh, we want an optimize uh, optimal functionality and uh, the care of the residual limb is, is, is focused on an early mobilization and, and, and at this time most of the hospitals as we still see is uh, with soft dressings and uh, it's not the use of the rigid dressing is implemented all over the place. And the goals of this post-operative management is to provide a clean wound healing environment, that's what we want. And of course, reduce swelling of the, of the, of the residual limb, uh, uh, pain, and, and uh, protect the, the limb from, from traumas. And as also Magnus already mentioned, uh, make sure that we reduce the, re the, the flexion contractures in the, uh, in the knee, but also in the hip, uh, sometimes forgotten. Um, so if we go to um, the, ne the next slide, I briefly go into the, the, the amputations. We all know, most of us known, and I think also in the, the participants know that the vascular disease with or without diabetes mellitus is the, is the main group. In the developed countries like UK, like the Netherlands, like Sweden, uh, France, Germany, 90% uh, of our amputees are, are vascular disease and 70% of those vascular diseases are also connected with diabetes. So there's a huge, huge amount of, of, uh, of, of that group. And uh, that immediately also means that our group, as also Magnus said, is 65 plus. 80%, 85% is 65 plus. Uh, trauma and tumor is, is uh, 4 or 5% of each congenital. And then, of course, we have um, what we see, uh, have seen, not in these, uh, uh, maybe we see a stop on that. It's like the, the bacterial diseases that we see, people taking uh, bacteria from China, from uh, Chile, from uh, Mexico back home, and uh, suddenly find themselves with a problem in their blood and get amputated because of that. Or maybe this... Uh, or coronavirus will give a short stop on that, but uh, let's see. So, and after the surgery, the rehabilitation goal is to restore the mobility and enabling them uh, the, over time to achieve as much independence as possible. And as in the UK, as in, uh, in Holland and in Germany, uh, the stay in the hospital should be the focus as short as possible. Uh, it costs money and to make sure that they go to a rehab center or that people go home. And, and make them independent as possible. And that's, 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 an, that's, an, that's, that's a quite a good, great goal. And, um, and, um, and, and as Magnus in, in showed in the study of Larsen, it was that an efficient team approach has proven to be very successful and make sure that we can reduce that hospital stay um, and an effective use of the prosthesis. Um, looking at timelines, um, the, whole, the whole treatment pathway, is that you? We have a pre-op, uh, pre-operative uh, phase. We did discuss that already. Magnus also mentioned that the importance of physical therapy. We have a lot of physical therapists here um, uh, in in the, in, in, in the webinar. Um, the the, the um, uh, not everybody has the possibility to do pre-operative um, uh, physical therapy. One reason can be because we do not, you do not see them. Uh, a lot of traumas get amputated immediately, and sometimes if you have the possibility, then a uh, uh, then they, they get an early amputation or they extend the time to amp amputation. And the mo most important part is that it is on the radar. If you have the possibility as a physical therapy or as an hospital, uh, please start with that uh, part as soon as possible. Focused on. Walking with crutches, uh, proper circularization, uh, uh, ability to walk, muscle function. These are the folks for that part. Then the amputation itself. Um, not going to discuss that one uh, too much. Uh, the only thing that you should know is that post-operative uh, management starts immediately after amputation and affects already in the, in, the surgical, in the surgical room, in the theater. That's where it starts. 
um, shaping. <clears throat> one is done afterwards, but the surgeon is the one and uh, that, that starts the shaping in the first step. He is the one that is responsible for the first shape of the residual limb. Um, so that's that's where it, that comes in, and then immediately afterwards you want to start your post-operative uh, rehabilitation, starting with a whether it is a soft dressing or a rigid dressing or removable rigid dressing, but you want to start as soon as possible. Um, so that's your post-op stage. That can can be for some people can be longer, some people can be shorter, depending on the cause of the amputation of your fitness or being a uh, a smoker, uh, nutrition, as we saw before, is also very important. So, an uh, application of a rigid dressing, this is what we as USER uh, always um, uh, try to uh, market and, and, and tell the people outside, com combined with physical therapy. The next stage will be the compression therapy, again, physical therapy included, and then the late latest phase will be the early fitting of a prosthesis, direct socket, and again, uh, focus on, on gait training in the last stage. So, that is your that is our also post-op program. Now, <clears throat> focusing on the um, on the post-operative care, uh, rigid dressing and physical therapy. <clears throat> the first goal <clears throat> is, is edema control, wound healing, and, and and pain management. Of course, pain management is connected with uh, edema control and uh, wound healing. Um, the clinical challenge in this phase is, is uh, can differ in each phase, but in the first, let's say, first two days or the, the immediately after the amputation, your edema control and your wound healing is 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 key. That's why we want to uh, start it immediately. Uh, we have an immediate post-operative phase and a post-operative phase. Um, Let me see here. So edema <coughs> causes swelling and um, uh, creates more volume, uh, skin necrosis, and, and, and that can prevent uh, the wound from healing. And uh, that's also why you want to start your mobilization. And early mobilization is not getting on your feet. It is also starting with uh, muscle contraction, uh, short movements of the stump. Uh, th those things are very important to get that blood flow, the pump mechanism ongoing. Good. Now, when to start? Uh, there are some hospitals that start later, even two or three days later after the amputation with their application of a dressing, whether it's a soft dressing, rigid dressing, or a removable rigid dressing. Um, and there are even hospitals in other countries that they even start five to seven days post-operative with a dressing and leave the wound, as we had already in the uh, questions, leave the wound open or, let's say, uh, soft tissue healing uh, uh, do their job. Uh, but the evidence <coughs> suggests that we should start with a pressure on the, on the residual limb as soon as possible with a soft dressing or a rigid dressing to manage that edema. Edema is 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 a let's say can be a very very um, uh, prominent um, uh, there and and can delay the the wound from healing and also cause pain. So immediately the starting the uh, pressure with a um, with a dressing is 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 very important. And studies have come have, have have shown that um, uh, as soon as you start with your, the sooner you start with your post-operative dressing, uh, we see with transitive amputees that there's fewer complications and also less revisions uh, after um, uh, in, in the post-operative phase. So that's a, that's a good sign. So <clears throat> if you look at Delayed or not delayed, going back and forth now, we like to start immediately after. And as even evidence suggests that we should do that. Um, then the application of a dressing. Now, if you do look at the application of a dressing, there are several possibilities. Soft dressing is done a lot. Uh, Semi-rigid dressing, uh, rigid dressing, and the removable rigid dressings. And we like to, um, so we'll put in a polling now. Yeah, I'm building that up for you, just a sec. 
Yeah. Just to get a feel for what is done in the different in the different countries, but also done in the UK. Um, on rigid dressing or on dressings or in applications. So the question is more, what is the biggest disadvantage of soft dressing use immediately post-operative? It's, it's a bit of a suggestive question. Uh, that might also be for other hospitals a very positive and benefit for using soft dressing. It's a multiple choice question, so you can give multiple answers and the TT just in this case for this transtubial, yeah. transtubial application. So keep your votes coming in, still got a few to go. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk through it, Peter, and I'll just launch this one. We've got a few more votes in. Yeah. So um, soft dressing is, as, as an order, as in Germany, is used a lot. And, um, and, and we see also with them, we see good, um, good positive results. However, there are downsides. If you look at all the studies, they are done between soft dressings and rigid dressings. And there are some considerable differences in the use of um, and the, the uh, application. There you go. Okay, there you are. That looks very good. That looks very good. So um, one of the disadvantages is, as, and if you can leave it like this, uh, Richard, the reapplication uh, every day, that can be a benefit, but it can also be a downside. So time, time uh, is, is, is hugely involved here. You need skilled people, uh, nursing staff or physical therapists that need to be able to do like five to seven times a day, a reapplication of your soft dressing. Typically, you start uh, your application in the morning, and after an hour, it's already like on the, somewhere else in your bed. Uh, and you have to find it again and reapplicate again. If you want to keep a sufficient and efficient pressure on the stump, uh, on the residual limb, you need to do that several times a day. So time is involved and skills are involved in that one. Volume control. Now, volume control is 57%. Um, uh, that is the main benefit of having a removable uh, over rigid dressing and not a soft dressing. So volume control is a huge disadvantage of soft dressings. Um, having a correct from distal to proximal reduction of your uh, pressure with a soft dressing uh, is very difficult. So volume control is a real challenge in this case. Wound care, 45%. Different kinds of perspectives here. Wound care can be very positive with a soft dressing because you will lose it during the day. You have to reapplicate it during the day. So you can check on the wound uh, several times. Um, however, connected with the volume control, there is a downside. You wanna, because edema also delays wound care. Range of motion. 31%, um, range of motion is, is uh, the fact that you have a range of motion with the soft dressing is a downside in if you connect it to contractures. So uh, you cannot control in the transterior amputee, you cannot control the knee, you cannot control the flexion of the knee. The flexion, the hamstrings want to flex the knee, so they're quite strong. And as you saw in the, in the, in the presentation of uh, Magnus, 72 hours, you only need for that to f have the first reduction of your uh, range of motion. And physiotherapy. Well, soft dressing uh, does not really um, uh, delay your physical therapy. You can always do physical therapy. Your focus will be more on the range of motion because there, your, your rigid dressing can you not, not help you in that case. So, um, yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> do I have control again, Richard? Or? Yeah. Okay. Good. I have to shuffle it again, I guess. There we are. Disadvantages of the conventional non, uh, methods: no possibility for wound inspection. Goes fast through this. Volume management of the residual limb, as said before. Hygienical, hygienical restrictions. So. There needs to be a clean cover for every fresh uh, surgical wound. Um, it can make physical therapy uh, uh, difficult. And as I mentioned before, there's a logistic support. So it needs to be 
changed on a regular basis and uh, re-applicated it on several times. So that's um, some downsides. And that's the reason that we as USER decided to go uh, for a removable rigid dressing and in our uh, uh, development for products. And it needs to be a removable rigid dressing. So it needs to be easy, applicable, and um, uh, immediately applicable in the, in the surgical theater and also for wound healing in the first week and also for physical therapy and also for protection uh, uh, applicable. So a removable rigid dressing compared to all the soft dressing is let's say the preferred option uh, combined with physical therapy. Key focus for, for your physical therapy in this first phase is mainly based on uh, <coughs> positioning of your residual limb in the bed. Make sure that you have your knee extended if it isn't in a removable dressing it is an extended knee and you have to initiate mobilization that means contraction uh, pump mechanism of the muscles needs to be uh, activated to make sure that you have that <coughs> blood flow ongoing and you can get rid of that edema because edema is a normal reaction on a trauma and the amputation was in fact your trauma um good then in the whole, um, let's say, removable dressing, we decided uh, for the uh, usher rigid dressing, the, 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 the development. So the, all the studies and all the clinical evidence and performance that we have is on a removable rigid dressing versus a soft dressing. And the usher rigid dressing is, is, a, is, a, is a, a product that fits into the removable rigid dressings. We do not have studies as such on the removal as a, as a rigid dressing but all the removable rigid dressing studies are applicable on the uh, usher rigid dressing so uh, i think i hand over now to you richard for Good. showing what it can bring to us oh uh, wait yeah sorry go ahead it's okay i'm just going to quickly show you this um just put it on yeah. my desk out so we, we have um so on the Oscar rigid removable dressing, we, we have, this comes in two sizes. So it's a small and a large, and that's for different circumferences of the residual limb um, taken both slightly plucked from the distal end and also around the thigh. We had a question earlier about where does this rigid dressing come up to? Um, does it extend above the knee for the transtibials? And when we go to Felix, we'll take a look at that. But inside what we have is uh, a number of items, one of which is um, always our instructions for use. So one here you can see that we've got uh, instructions for application and Felix will take us through this. That, that's very important We go through that. And then we have the rigid dressing itself. I'm not going to open it. It's, um, it's sterilised. It's absolutely for single patient use. But it's um, a plastic material with Velcro strapping and a um, a port there for our vacuum pump. And what you also get with the kit is this vacuum pump um, and it's just a simple entrance into the rigid dressing through here and we, all, we often get asked questions like um, what pressure does it go to but it, it's not about pressure it's a vacuum pump and it doesn't actually uh, apply any theoretically any load to the soft tissue or the skin it simply conforms to the shape and that's the process that um, Felix will go to now. So, um, Peter, we're ready to go over to Felix or just see if he's ready. Yep. Uh, got the thumbs up from Felix. There we go. You want to talk us through this, Peter? So, um, just before we start, Felix is there with um, our demonstration user today, uh, Jürgen, I believe. Good afternoon for you because you guys are in Bayreuth in Germany, just near uh, Nuremberg. Um, oh, and uh, and. Uh, is Assistant Volker, good afternoon to you too. So, Peter, Felix, over to you. So, as you can see here, the, uh, Felix and uh, Volker are uh, already in, uh, in, 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 the, in the room. Um, everything is prepared. We have a trans-tibial uh, amputee um, ready to get an application of the uh, rigid dressing. And uh, Felix and Volker will now uh, go through the application of the rigid dressing. Felix, I'll hand over to you. Please um, combine your application with uh, some words. 
Yeah, I will do my best. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, uh, for the uh, already shared presentations. Uh, thanks, Richard, for uh, the unboxing. So we can immediately uh, go ahead to the fitting. Uh, we have uh, today Jürgen in. Uh, he's uh, amputee since 2006, uh, caused by a trauma. Um, usually, you, you can do easily uh, the, uh, up the uh, uh, donning and duffing of the red dressing uh, yourself. But in case you have a helping hand, choose one of your friends or colleagues uh, to help out. It makes life easier and you can be even more precise with, with the fitting. Um, one thing makes sense to, to take care of to, to cover uh, uh, the leg uh, fully of the user because the rigid dressing is made of, let's say, a uh, 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 wipeable plastic. You can easily clean it. So uh, if it gets direct contact to the skin, most probably you will sweat. Uh, and that's why a, 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 a cotton uh, to, to prevent that uh, is, 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 is useful. In the rich dressing, we have plastic balls. And if you unbox it, most probably the balls will fall to the bottom. So make sure before you apply uh, the rich dressing that they're all diverse and equally um, uh, um, in, the, in the back, basically. Um, what you should do, because it's a Velcro, and you know Velcro sticks to almost everything which gets contact to, as soon as you open the Velcro, make sure you close it again in order not to destroy uh, the pants uh, or, or, or the, the bed sheets or whatever, and everything sticks to the Velcro. So I immediately close it again. We have three of them. Make sure that um, the rich dressing covers the leg and uh, at least uh, 15 centimeters above the patella uh, should be covered. In this case, it's totally fine. You even have to make sure that the perineum area is not uh, in contact with the rich dressing in order to get any irritations in that area, which are quite uncomfortable. Um, the helping hand is good to hold the distal part in order to make sure you can cover everything properly without any wrinkles. So I ask now my colleague Volker to cover the distal part of the rigid dressing. Right, like this. I can cover the rest and close the top part. Make sure you don't have too many wrinkles in there and stop with the medial Velcro to cover. Just tighten it briefly because we have to readjust it later on after we took out uh, the air out of the system. Then the bottom Velcro, close it for a certain time. Make sure the rich address is not slipping off like this. Like Richard showed already, there is a pump uh, in the boxing to take the air out of the system. With the pump, there comes an adapter attached to the distal end of the, of the tube. This is not needed. I immediately cut it off so it's not irritating you while using the pump. On the uh, proximal uh, anterior part of the uh, uh, rich dressing, there's the valve. It usually comes untightened, so the valve is open. Air can get in for the easy applying. Before you take out the air, make sure it's closed properly. And now you can attach the pump. It's conical, so it will hold in, in position. And what you basically do now is you deflate air. While doing it, the dressing will get rigid, air will get out, and there is no manometer or anything on the pump. What you have to do, you have to stop when you can't get more air out of the system. Like now, disconnect the pump, ask the user if he's happy. You good? That's good. That's the goal. Now you can start 
readjusting the valve crew again, make sure it's tightened enough, but don't add too much tension on that. It's just to prevent the rigid dressing to fall off uh, the user leg. Okay, relax. Because of the uh, material, which is not breathable, of course, um, you should make sure that uh, three times a day, at least, you should undo the uh, rigid dressing and make sure that some fresh air gets on the user uh, leg in order to, let's say, dry and recover from the total covered um, environment. So what you basically have to do is undo the Velcros, like I mentioned before, close them immediately. Relax. And open the system again. You can see it holds the shape of the leg. Some fresh air gets onto the user's uh, skin for about 15 to 20 minutes. And it's set to done it again. Uh, some say you can just leave the air out and just cover it again because you haven't moved the leg. I'm a fan of completely undoing it and taking out the air again properly to make sure the fit is good as it should be. So again, starting with the medial strap, close it gently, close it gently, this little part here again. You can open the valve, as you can see, air gets in. You can hear the sound, hopefully. Close it again and start the process with the pump to make sure fit is good, air is out properly, and the user is set for the next couple of hours. And if my colleague is doing it, I'm doing it, or our colleagues in the hospital, like nurses, are doing it, the outcome in the end and the fitting in the end will be almost always the same. What I forget, forgot in the beginning, <laughs> make sure uh, you measure the right uh, uh, size uh, of the rigid dressing. I will go to that part now. Life is easy when you have only two sizes, small and large. If you have done it a couple of times, I'm sure you know it without measuring what, what's the right size but it's basically the same like when you use liners. Measure four, centimeter, four centimeters from the distal end, the circumference, and then 50 centimeters from the distal end. So really proximal, like I mentioned, close to the peritoneum area. And then we have the sizing small up to 38 centimeters and large 38 to 61. So size difference is quite um, uh, 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 quite different. So for a regular user, I think small is the way to go. Otherwise, if the leg is quite swollen or long, you should uh, uh, choose the size large. Good. Good work, yeah. Felix. Thank I you. think that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you, Thank you for Felix, for now. Thanks, team. Go back to your presentation, Peter, here we go. Yes. I give you control again of your mouse. There you go, right, where you go. Okay. So going back to the removal rigid dressing, the, uh, we see here a few uh, re removable rigid dressings. Um, looking at what Felix just showed, we can see uh, an, an easy application of, an, uh, of a rigid dressing. Uh, with a good control of uh, edema, and we we have a lot of studies. Uh, the the study of NADA, but also but also the study of the the VA uh, in the US have good uh, studies on on using a, a removal rigid dressing with good outcomes on uh, edema control. Uh, physical therapy, again, um, it is said a lot, but we do also have in the VA documents uh, even good clinical support 
on physical therapy where earlier uh, when it's proven that early mobilization activates the cardiovascular system and that supports again the edema management so the blood flow the pump mechanism and at, at the end in the good edema management and contractures um, also stated before not really a lot of studies on the last study mentioned on this uh, slide is from uh, Thicke and a uh, in, in, in a transtibial amputation management uh, book and that's where it said where contractures can be controlled and, may, and, 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 and stopped when the knee is correctly included in the removable dressing. And that is an important part. So it's not the removable dressing, but it should be. That's why the sizing is so important. You need some sort of lever arm uh, above the knee to make sure that you can control that knee flexion. That is very important. Um, what I'd like to mention here also is that the uh, if you look at the eye views of the uh, removal of the ursa rigid dressing the, it's a transtibial use but um, i've been in a hospital in holland where we use the large uh, size of the ursa rigid dressing also for knee uh, disarticulations so very good uh, so there's no of course uh, contracture problem but protection of the residual limb uh, a good healing process uh, wound uh, healing and wound airing is possible with it so it's very good uh, even for the for the knee disarticulations and i just mentioned this because it's done in holland a lot of the knee disarticulation i do know that in a lot of countries it's not like a common uh, amputation wound inspection um, <clears throat> study of Reichmann, also mentioned by um, uh, Magnus, shows that, uh, that, that the rigid dressing, removable rigid dressing, allows for good wound assessments, and good wound assessment also accelerates the wound healing. So, um, again, good um, um, clinical references for, for using a rigid dressing. This is what uh, Felix already showed. This is the wound assessment. So opening it up, uh, leave it open for 15 to 20 minutes, a few times a day. And uh, if necessary, depending on your wound, uh, you change the under wrap um, to make sure that uh, hygiene is, uh, is still okay for the wound, because that's uh, important. Um, Looking at the advantage of removal dressing, uh, inspection of the wound is clear. Prevention of trauma um, mentioned already with some data from Magnus. We also see a decrease in an incidence of injuries uh, using uh, a, a removal rich dressing from 70 to 20 percent. Uh, that was mentioned as a cause of the percentage that people fell, and they even saw uh, going down to zero. So that's that's very good, and it's not that. You know, the, it's it's not the injury itself, but it's re re amputation. It's other uh, injuries that can can be caused because of those falls. And don't forget, uh, most of the people that had an amputation are instable. First of all, because they have one leg. Secondly, because there are a lot of vascular problems, not only in the leg but maybe also in the rest of the body. So instability going from horizontal to a vertical position. It creates instability. They need time to adapt to it, and uh, for protection, uh, a removable dressing is is is, um, is um, very preferable. And last but not least, a reduced time to fitting, uh, prosthetic fitting. Lots of studies shows uh, Geertsen study, but also the VA show that we see a reduced fitting, time to fitting um, at the end, which is clear, of course. Uh, earlier mobilization creation earlier prosthetic fitting good then the compression therapy the second phase the goal of the of it uh, the compression therapy is to decrease the edema edema and also shape the residual limb let's say following on the amputation of the surgeon that that the first shaping then the removable dressing and then following it up with compression therapy to further on shape the um, the limb uh, if we would not do that, we would and leave it open. You saw in, this, in the graph of uh, Magnus, it will take to 90 days. So we want to reduce that time to shape that, that limb. 
and we do that with um, we do that with uh, our TF and TT post op liner, which are new liners. Um, we had uh, the, the the post op liner only for TT. We now have uh, two liners, um, the TF and the TT liner. They are transparent, so uh, you can uh, go, uh, uh, look through, which also gives you the opportunity to uh, to uh, co connect or co um, control the wound. Um, okay, I, I think we have a polling now. So for all the mainly for the physical therapist, I think if you can can pull him in, uh, Richard on. Um, yeah, here it comes. Yeah, so it's 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 the physical therapy. Um, this is a part where physical therapists are already active. So immediately after the amputation, they become active. They become involved in the whole process, and 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 there's a focus, of course. So what what do you think as a physical therapist, but also non-physical therapist can answer the question, of course. Uh, what do you think is the main focus of that um, physical therapy in this phase? Um, because every phase has a different kind of focus, and of course, it's depending on the, uh, the the status of the wound, the status of the patient, the physical status, uh, what you can do and what you should do. Just leave it a few more seconds. Get a few more answers in. That's yeah. coming. Um, give it five more seconds. Now they're coming in. There we go. Three. Two, one, good. Let's see what we've got. So here you go. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so let's start with the residual limb uh, range of motion. I think it's a very important one. As mentioned before, uh, uh, the knee is very important, but we sometimes tend to forget the hip. People do lie in bed a lot. They sit in this phase, also sit on chairs or sit in a wheelchair. Uh, so really do not forget the, the hip on this one. Uh, the strength of the, the, the residual limb strength, the muscle strength, very important. So you go from contraction, you go to more movement. So active movement of the residual limb, um, all based on what is possible in terms of pain, uh, of course, uh, and physical uh, possibilities. Uh, residual limb positioning again connected with the range, range of motion very good trunk control core stability is also an important one so people uh, sitting on the side of the bed or sitting in a chair where you can also start preparing them for standing which is the next phase preparing to uh, to to use that trunk and be stable uh, get the balance in sitting get the balance in standing afterwards and then self-management and self-management is, is of course a very wide uh, thing. It's self-management can be uh, a, a, a apply your own uh, liner, uh, put on your own shirt. Uh, so these things are also uh, included in that. Very good. Yeah. Great. So brings me to the next one. Um, wiggle a bit. Robert. Yep. So positioning residual limb strength, range of motion, prevent contractures is still uh, visible. Standing is maybe a bit too early in this phase. It's the next phase. Uh, standing, going from a horizontal to a vertical position is, is quite uh, a huge um, uh, stress for, 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 for the, on the stability. Um, good. Okay. So, we tend to go for compression therapy with our post-op liners. And why, why do we do that? So what, what you want is a consistent compression of the, on the residual limb. That means that you want a consistent uh, distal higher compression on the proximal side, a lower compression. So that you have, that you have a good uh, decrease of that, supporting the edema management. That's an important one. Uh, so the liners are built in a way that they have this decrease of compression. You can see that in the, in the graph. The green one is the trans, uh, tibial one, size 28. You see a distal compression that is higher than the uh, proximal compression and a nice decrease. 
The distal one has a higher compression because we have a matrix there. And this is the black one is the transfemoral aligner. Also a decrease, less decrease in the last part, but still a decrease. So sizing, and this is a chart that we used before, and I just wanted to, 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 to go into this one because it's very important that you do your sizing correctly. Um, the, 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 the box, the purple box in top is a class four where you are over the 46 millimeter um, uh, pressure. Uh, that is an, an, a risky area. This is, that's a strong pressure that you do not want. Uh, you will not get a good edema management. So if you want an, uh, an, a, a correct edema management, you need to be over the 20. So you need, where's my mouse? So you need to be in this area between the 20 and the, let's say 40, where you have a good compression uh, from distal to uh, proximal and that supports your edema management. Higher means risky area. Uh, so sizing is important. Good. That supports your shape. Oh, wait, this one. And then the physical therapy, again, supports the control of the edema with active exercises, activate the muscle pump. And then in the study of Geertsen, uh, we see that there's, a, there's even evidence on that to do that. So that supports the edema management. Um, you want to go into the, um, Richard, you want to go into the liner? Yeah, we can take a look at that. I'll yeah, just uh, that. stop my camera and Felix is ready as well. Yeah. I'll just take the mouse, Peter. Thank you. And there we go. Let me find my camera. There we are. Good. Right. So what we have here, as Peter said, and this is one of our transtibial liners for the post-op. They come in a variety of sizes. Felix will show us maybe how we, we measure for those. Um, so in the box, it's very similar to our regular silicon liners. So this is a, a silicon liner. Uh, these are multiple patient use and of course can be, can be cleaned and there's a process for that. But one of the issues or one of the, the criteria is that, let's just take this packaging out. Um, is that we have this easy dry coating on the outside. So you can see that the liner is able to pass over itself very easily with minimal friction. And that's very important because when we put these liners on, we invert them absolutely inside out. And if you think back now to the discussion we had about um, a sagittal, sagittal flaps or long posterior flap, when you have sagittal flaps and you have that wound, the very distal aspect, when these liners roll on, then what happens is that as the silicon rolls over the top, it grabs the skin and actually causes that wound area to, to actually pull together. So it actually minimizes a traumatic uh, risk to the wound um, moving or displacing the silicon, it goes skin on skin and the wound you're dressing on there also. It actually stabilizes the wound in that environment. But if also you think of the long posterior flap and you think of where the scar line is anterior, and over where maybe the, the, the cut end of tibia is, as the liners sometimes roll over, it can actually pull on that area a little bit. So that's another reason why this whole process works with, with these liners. And you see something else in here, we have this what we call a stabilizing matrix, this sort of um, whiter area here, and that minimizes stretch or elongation longitudinally. But we always try to make these liners nice and elastic radially, but longitudinally where the stabilizing matrix is, they're very stiff and stiff therefore means stable and it means that they're protecting the soft tissue in that environment. So that's just an example of, of what the post-op liners are, um, reusable uh, units have a range of these in different sizes and of course with re reapplication and assessment you can chase down that, um, that volume reduction as it, as it occurs. What we'll do now we'll go over to Felix who's um waiting there with uh, Jürgen again. And Felix, you're going to take us just through that application. Over to you. You're, I think you're muted, Felix, by the way. Um, so we can't hear you, which is a shame. <laughs> now you can hear me. Now we can. I hope. Yeah. Great. 
thank you, Richard, for the introduction. Uh, again, with Jürgen and now Volker is uh, on the uh, mobile camera. I really hope, guys, you can hear me properly because you have to make sure everything is protected. Um, yes. However, yeah. thank you, Richard. <laughs> for some wondering why uh, my liner here is with a yellow line and the one Richard just showed was a pink line. That's just the difference of the sizing of this uh, stabilization, stabilize, stabilizing matrix. Uh, definitely worth to mention is how easy to roll on the liner because of that smooth coating. So it's easy to handle even with gloves. It's not sticky at all. Make sure it's properly unfolded so there's no air bubble covered between uh, the liner and the skin apply it super straight and make sure the leg is fully on the distal end attached and then you can roll it on super smooth make sure no wrinkles occur the positioning of the uh, knee joint should be slightly flexed to add comfort as well and because it's a trans tibial liner in this case you don't have to uh, cut the liner or trim the liner so it's easy to reuse for tf liners it looks a bit different because of the proximal trim line with an tf user it the likelihood that you have to uh, 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 throw it throw away the liner actually after one user is quite high because the trim line is always custom made for duffing the liner again don't how to say uh, roll it like this because you will add a lot of compression during that process uh, to the skin and to the blood flow make sure it's unfolded only one layer and then you can duff it easily especially for users the distal end is of course quite sensitive make sure you know you don't pull on the distal end while duffing it. Make sure you smoothly roll it off until you reach the end and then take it off because it's quite adhesive on the inside. If you pull on that area, skin damage uh, is, is uh, quite uh, easy to uh, get. Because the user is usually at this time in the hospital or on the bed relaxing, recovering, it's good that you can train and the user can get used to how to done and off a liner uh, when he has a lot of time to do so. So I always ask the user to do it himself and train him on that so he can use the time at home or in the hospital or rehab center to get used to dunning and dusting a liner. So Jürgen, please show us how you do it usually. Make sure this end is covered properly due to the fact that outer surface is coated like you mentioned already you don't need any uh, spray dunning spray no wrinkles and because of the nice uh, semi-transparent surface if you get a bit closer Volker relax a bit yeah thank you you can see easily the inside and uh, the uh, how to say the skin uh, uh, covered with the liner if there's any if there are any any air bubbles in between you can get them out if any skin uh, is is like wrinkled underneath the liner because of the dunning process and even of course uh, the usual uh, uh, patch which is because of the surgery is on the distal end you can make sure that uh, this is like positioned properly um <laughs> again i forgot the measuring <laughs> <laughs> Measuring tape is needed, uh, four centimeters from distal end, of course, on bare skin. Now taking off the liner again. I hope we're not running out of time. I'd like to show you that only once, shortly. For uh, storing the liner after cleaning it or overnight, however, Make sure it's unrolled again and you use the stand which comes with the liner to make sure it keeps the shape. 
So coming to the sizing, four centimeter from distal, taking the circumference and make sure you're with the TT liner between 22 and 45 centimeters. This is the range we have uh, with our TT liners. The matrix length is always 10 centimeters. This won't change with the different sizing. So we've got a few questions, Felix, for you, um, or, and Peter as well. Um, one of them says, can this be used with patients that still have clips in or only with sutures? For sure, they, they need to be covered. Yeah. Uh, and there's also a question about, can the liner be used with wound dressing underneath? Again? Yeah. And the line that be used with a wound dressing underneath, and the answer to that is is yes, yes, it can. Yes, yeah, with a, a small, yeah. a small dressing. Small just, dressing, yeah, not not a whole wrap. Yeah. Exactly. And, then, and then, Felix, if you if the liner is off, and um, if you have a few questions relating to the distal end, what's the? Somebody's asked, is there a hole at the distal end? Um, so we mean where the pin connects. Yeah. So we have some people who are not prosthetic people in the audience. So what is the what is the round part at the end? What is that for? Uh, the goal is actually to um, be as close as to the definitive liner um, with the socket uh, for the user in the end. So that's why, how Richard explained, we have uh, the matrix inside to have an increase, or let's say a decrease of compression from proximal to distally. And connected to this matrix, we have a cup into it. It's a plastic cup which is nice because it's flexible. It won't um, 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 have pressure peaks on this land, even though it's a bit bony. And you could connect uh, a usual pin uh, to the distal end, to the cup. You can screw it on. Even depending on the country, I have to say, you can use it for early rehab for the first steps. You can build a socket on that one. Or for users, it's easy to train and get used to how to done and off the liner to add the pin so they see if the liner is positioned correctly in the right ankle and completely straight um, yeah. according to the, uh, the leg. Yeah, okay. So, um, and also that it's not an actual hole, the silicon on the inside is covered com completely. It's just this is an external component. So, when the pin is screwed in, that doesn't in any way intrude into the inside of the of the liner. And one um, thing, one just one more there, maybe... Richard from Grace, just asking about what stage you can start using the liner for compression. Is it after the first seven days? Yeah, I think. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we'll, Peter yeah. will come on to that next. I think. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. There's one thing yeah. I would like to mention here is with every uh, post op liner we have a laser mark on the distal end. Uh, showing the date of manufacturing and the sizing, and of course the CE mark and the ERSA sign, so you can easily uh, um, uh, uh, track and trace <laughs> the uh, liner during the entire process with different users uh, or the same user, of course. Yeah. So there's another question as well. I'm, I'm going to say thank you, Felix, um, Jürgen, and Volker as well. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. And we have another question. Um, what's your opinion on compression shrinker socks? So maybe like the, um, the compression socks that we're used to. Those are certainly part of a regime. Um, I think, Peter, I'll let you take that one if you explain, first of all, where we are with, uh, just lose that, where we are with um, yep. the, the, the program and using the compression therapy program. Yeah. I, I'm just going to restart the presentation for you. There you go. Yep. Thanks. Um, give, it a wiggle, give it a wiggle. And you, Peter, there you go. Okay. So um, uh, coming back on that um, question, um, the latest, the last study here from Figie and Casillas gives you there's a significant positive effect on wound healing with use of silicon liners. So this is a study that is based on use of, of, of uh, stump shrinkers and uh, soft dressings and silicon liners. And the, the biggest, biggest uh, benefit of using liners is that the wound healing uh, process is much better with a silicon liner. 
uh, instead of uh, soft dressing or with uh, uh, stump shrinkers. So that, that's a huge, huge benefit compared to that one. However, I think we should also state that control of the wound uh, is, is very important. So a charge is always included. Uh, so you have to manage the stump volume. You have to make sure that you do your sizing correctly. If you need a, a liner that is smaller, you have to do that at the correct time because otherwise you do not have the efficient or sufficient pressure. So that is important to know. Plus, there is a some sort of a, let's say, daily uh, build up. Uh, the moment that you're, and that is on, on, the, on, the, on, on the surgeon and on the, uh, on the staff, on the nurse staff, when do you start with a liner? It depends on your wound and on your edema. And that, that can be five days, it can be seven days. And from that day on, you start a process where you start with one hour on the first day in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, building it up for the next seven days to four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon. And uh, during the night, you could do without, you could do with a, a stump shrink, but you can also use the, uh, in the first two days, you can also use the um, uh, as Richard dressing for night care protection. Uh, that is also... Uh, so you have to make sure that you have a, a moment in between of an hour or one and a half hour to uh, to um, uh, let the resilient limb accommodate to that. So that's important. Good. So this is what we covered already, that the liner is also, the transceiver liner is also applicable for using with a socket. And that brings me to the last one. This is more, this one is uh, where we have in that whole post-op program, the last stage is the direct socket uh, fabrication, early mobilization. If this whole process is correct, that of followed correctly with the correct um, uh, applications, you have an earlier mobilization. We've seen that in, in lots of studies, and uh, especially the, the the direct socket method is an efficient one. It's it's consistent and a standardized, simple. And as Magnus already said, it's a bit higher cost, but the outcomes are much higher. And that is immediately also the, let's say, the barrier that we see in lots of countries, because looking at cost, people will start not using it, but looking at the outcomes, looking at the functional outcomes, looking at the standardization or early mobilization, it would make completely sense to, um, to uh, uh, go for a direct socket immediately afterwards. Um, and if you have your direct socket, if you went through it, then of course gate rehab is, is really uh, uh, the next step. And I will please to have hand over to Rachel, who will give some uh, explanation about gate rehab. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. So I've only got the one slide to talk about here. Um, yes. but this is a little bit to cover. Um, so what I wanted to first talk about was if we compare our normal gait as a, as a non-amputee, what we look at is that 60-40 split between stance phase and swing phase. We have a reasonably symmetrical gait and it's usually quite energy efficient unless we have some other sort of comorbidities or injuries that, that affects this. So when we start talking about our amputee gait, um, when they're using their prosthetic leg, what we actually find is that it's more like a 40-60 split between stance and swing. So it's, it's the opposite way around to normal. And this often requires a significant increase in energy demand, even over a small distance. And very often it's not symmetrical and displays various gait deviations. So the reasons for that some of these deviations, we, we address some of these in early physio management as Magnus and Peter have both described. Things like preventing contractures, strengthening key muscle groups, um, oedema management, and also some element of pain management there as well. But as and again, as we've seen, there are solutions to help speed up that time from amputation to prosthetic limb fitting. And again, we know that the, the quicker we can mobilise our patients, the better it is for some of their healing, but also mentally, that feeling of being upright and, and being back in control again of, of how they're mobilising. So what when we're beginning to mobilize our patients the issues that we tend to see are usually stem to the fact that they struggle to load their prosthetic limb and this can cause various compensations which ultimately are detrimental to their gait 
So what we tend to find is they have their new normal midline, which is usually from that time between the amputation and when we're, we're starting to get them up and mobilizing maybe with an early walking aid. Um, but, you know, they're having to adjust to this new normal midline of when they're sitting down, when they're transferring, when maybe when they're standing. And because they're not, they've not got that second leg to weight bear through. We also find that there may be some lateral hip instability, which leads to an increased pelvic drop um, and trunk deviation. We have maybe hip flexure contractures, as Peter alluded to earlier, which causes an increase in lumbar lordosis, anterior pelvic tilt, which means that we then have this lack of hip extension. And what this can also cause is a lack of transverse pelvic rotation, so that forwards backwards movement we get as we, we take a step. And the impact of these is quite often seen during the swing phase, despite the issue actually being during stance. And generally what we tend to do, especially during the early part of our amputee rehab training uh, with their prosthetic limb, is that we get the prosthetist involved and say, oh, you know, it looks a little bit long, it needs to do this, they're catching the toes. And we get something adjusted when actually what we need to address is what's happening in their stance phase. So quite often we'll see that they're spending more time in this double support phase. Um, they're taking a shorter step with their sound side because of what's happening with not being able to load the prosthesis. They're getting a faster loading onto their sound side with a heavier impact. And all of this can increase their energy consumption while they're walking, which makes it so much more difficult to walk the same distance they were doing before. But it also increases the risk of secondary conditions. So we, We've all read the papers about increased um, arthritis on the sound side, lower back pain. We know the majority of our amputees get this within the first two years of their amputation. So these are all things that we still need to consider when we're training our, our patients. Not only do we then see a longer prosthetic step because we've got a shorter sound side, quite often this isn't actually that controlled. And often again, it'll be abducted out to the side because they want to increase their base of support to give them some more balance and stability. Often our users will start off struggling to achieve a smooth heel to toe rollover. And if they're not getting that load onto the toes, they're not getting any of that push off power from the foot either. They could have the best foot in the world, but if they're not loading the toes, they're not gonna get a lot out of it. We also see that through the lack of some of these movements, we get the toes catching, the prosthetic knee, if they have one, may not flex or it may not straighten properly, um, which eventually leads to these other compensations that, again, we commonly see throughout our amputees' lives of vaulting, hitching and circumducting their leg. One of the most common deviations we see, as, as I sort of mentioned, is the lack of pelvic displacement. So that's our anterior posterior movement, our lateral movement and also our rotation. So even if you're just missing one of these movements, it makes it very difficult to get an energy efficient gait. And this can also, and this is because it impacts arm swing. And this is really important for the restoration of an efficient symmetrical gait. Now, I don't have the videos on all of you like we normally do with our webinar training, but what I'd like you to try is just to sit on the edge of your chair and move your arms forwards and backwards. Now, what you can see or feel is that you get this little bit of trunk rotation and if you try to stop that rotation, you actually have to tense really hard from your core to do that. You're using more energy to stop that movement. And this is what a lot of our users are doing. They're clamping down around their core to try and stabilize something from, from lower up, usually around their hip. So they're stopping, they don't get that arm swing and they fix with their arms to try and save some of that energy and that stability. What it actually has is the opposite effect. And um, the amount of times we've walked through physio rooms, holding onto patient shoulders, trying to get them to get that rotation. And we can keep on doing that, but if we don't fix the problem that's causing that lack of rotation, they'll never get that when they go away out of the physio room. So this leads me on to talking about our walking aids and the typical ones we would use in physio. So initially we start off in the bars, they look really good, they might be doing small steps, but actually we're looking through we're looking to get that nice heel to toe rollover. They're getting a good step through pattern. They're looking fairly symmetrical. So we take them out of the bars and maybe put them on a Zimmer frame. But what we're doing with that Zimmer frame, and for some people this, this may very well be their limit, this is what they can manage. But 
what we do with our Zimmer frame is we get them to do a step two pattern. It's not very often someone can manage that full heel to toe rollover and actually manage a step through. Now the way to, to compensate with this is we give them one with wheels or we give them a four wheeled walker. Something that's that little bit more mobile that can continue that movement rather than a start stop movement. But this also um, restricts our users because we don't give them the opportunity to learn that reciprocal movement, that arm swing, that trunk rotation that's so important for an energy efficient gait. And as I said, for some users, this very much will be their limit. They need that wider base of support and the stability the frame gives them. But actually, we know that they use a lot more energy like that because they're using a lot more through their arms rather than through their, their limbs. And do, do these users who are probably more diabetic and vascular patients, are they, do they have this energy to spare to use this, this walking aid? So looking at progressing patients on, we've got the walking sticks, the tripods, and again, here, we have that ability to start off with a step two pattern, but really progress it for a step through. So we're getting a proper walking pattern, really getting them to utilize the carbon fiber foot that, that they're probably on and really get that push off and that energy return from loading the toes. So despite our best training with our users, sometimes these, these deviations will remain. However, if we look at with the rest of the team, the, the prosthetic foot prescription, it may allow us to better address or limit some of these deviations. So it's important that the majority of our users who have comorbidities like and problems from the vascular and diabetes, that they're, put, they're putting their sound leg at risk. So it's important that we do address this. So if we look at our ProFlex foot range, what we can see are features like increased range of motion. This is going to give us some safety in terms of foot placement on the floor, but also a more natural heel to toe rollover that, that we would get normally. And this means that we've got a smoother weight transfer as we're stepping forward, which means we're more likely to get some of that pelvic rotation that a lot of our users as lack. We also have a wider forefoot, so we've got more stability towards that late part of stance. Again, as we're transitioning forwards, if we look at our, our normal feet, our forefoot is wider than our heel. A lot of prosthetic feet don't have this. So again, it's a little bit more natural in the way our weight transfers forwards. In terms of energy return, again, we wanna load those toe on our carbon fiber feet to get that energy return and get that acceleration into swing. A lot of the time we see compensations from users not being able to do this by hitching their hip. Um, but again, this is gonna be something that allows us to get some of that pelvic rotation and get a more natural gait. And then things like torsion. So again, there's, there's various options with this, with a ProFlex feet or a, a, less, a less active user of the balance S foot. But we have not only a little bit of that natural rotation back, which is so important that our users have lost from their ankle joints, but we also get that bit of shock absorption as well. And again, this is something that is lost through amputation. And again, the higher the level, the more natural shock absorption and torsion we've lost. So for things like shearing forces and leading to things like back pain and issues around the, the residual limb. Not only that, but so balance. If, you, if you've ever had your ankle taken, you try to turn, you realize that you don't have that rotation in the ankle and it's much harder to keep the balance. So this is a topic I could continue to talk about for another two hours probably. But because as you can see, there's a lot that can impact our user's gait. And as a team, we can do a lot to address that and influence it before we actually even get the patient up and, and walking as Peter and Magnus have described. So to echo what Magnus said earlier about finding some, as physios, finding some gait training for amputees and, and really understanding, and it, it's essential to get the best outcome for your patient, but also being able to understand a little bit about the prosthetic components can be valuable too, in being able to get the patient to get the most out of that as well. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for that. Peter, a few concluding words from you. Peter, are you even there? I think Peter may have um, dropped out of that. That's my presentation. There you go. Okay. Good. Are you, any conclusion from you, Peter? Yeah. So I think um, what we're trying to do I've, um, is, 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 I think, what you look at the whole participants group, a lot of physical therapists are included in that. I think you look at the whole post op program. Um, 
from pre-operative operative to post-operative, I, I see a huge challenge uh, for a multidisciplinary team, the, a, a, a huge role for the physical therapist, for the uh, for the CPOs included on on selection of the of the line of selection of the, um, the 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 rigid dressing together with the, the surgeon. Surgeons are included, even the the, the early fitting, whether it's a, a plaster paris or it's a it's a direct socket. I think if 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 we as a team starting with the multidisciplinary team where Magnus started, I think if you would put that multidisciplinary team on this whole program, I think the outcome would be much and much be much better and the starting point for a physical for a for an amputee on the prosthesis uh in an earlier phase and even in a better condition okay. so good all right thank you thank you very much and that um, that pretty much wraps it up really um we're just a little bit over time um certainly all due for a cup of tea at the very least yep. but i want to thank everybody for for that for that uh, great presentation it's a um, a long story that we've, we've told, and I think it's just recognizing that our amputees as individuals are being passed through a chain of events that sometimes has their complete best interest at, at heart. Um, but also we, we've seen some regimes that's really just dealing with their current episode. And it's about how we, what we're dealing with now is preparing them for the next episode and the next episode, all with a common aim with everybody integrated in that together. And there's big opportunity there um, uh, on all aspects, and I think we've touched many of that. So I'm going to say a big thanks to you, Peter, uh, to um, Rachel as well, and Magnus as well. You're, you're back on that. We've had some good chat and questions. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions, Kate. I'm going to hand back to you now formally so you can close the meeting and uh, draw everything to a conclusion. Um, yeah, I think we have answered most of the questions. I've answered some um, privately as well, and I think most of them we've answered live. Um, I've just popped my email address in the chat box as well. So if you do have any additional questions or something comes up um, after this, then please um, send me an email and we can send you any additional information. Also, if you would like, you know, a specific kind of training um, or discussion just in your local um, centre, then we can by all means arrange that during during this time as well. Um, and then we will just continue to keep you updated with our um, upcoming webinars as well. We do have another one tomorrow on Rioni. Um, so if you've not received your invite for that, please let me know. But if you don't have any other questions, we'll hang around on the chat here for a little bit longer. Um, but otherwise, I just wish you um, a good afternoon. And thanks again for your time. And thanks to all the team here as well um, for you. the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Magnus. Thank you to you. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank You're you welcome. to you. Thank you. Good. And, and yes, great. we will share the references as well, and we'll send the, the details of that paper we spoke about earlier on. Just Rachel, so. thank you to you as well. Thank you. And also thank you to Felix. And the, um, thank you, guys. Pleasure. As well. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new phone. <laughs> a new phone for Felix. There you go. Good, there you go, Katie, thank you. Thank you. So we'll close the meeting, everyone. Thanks again. And um, okay. yeah, enjoy your lunch and afternoon.